Preaching the word of God is an awesome responsibility for any man because sometimes people's lives, their eternal destiny is weighed in the balance depending on what the man in the pulpit says or neglects to say. And it's important that the man in the pulpit, whoever he may be, preaches the word of God in its entirety and doesn't neglect preaching what needs to be preached. Um, several weeks ago, I, if you remember, I preached a sermon about getting used to the darkness. And there's a lot of darkness in this world. Jesus called us out of darkness to walk in the light because he's the light. But I did talk about darkness and it's so prevalent in our world today. There's so much sin that we've gotten used to that darkness. And it doesn't bother us as it did at one time. And I challenge you not to get used to it, but to stand up against it. Well, there's another thing that we've gotten used to over the years. I'm going to move this down because I really can't see them that well, and I don't want to have to look around here to see you. Um, and what we've gotten used to is division within the church. The Church of Jesus Christ has been denominated into many different denominations, different sects, um, S-E-C-T-S, I want to make sure I say that correctly, and that um, there's so much division within the church today. And one of the problems with division is that there are people who you talk to, I've talked to, and they'll t their excuse for not becoming a Christian their excuse for not giving their life to the Lord is, well, there are so many different denominations and I don't know which one is right and which one is wrong, so I just don't go to any of them. Division is against the teaching of Jesus Christ. I want to read some scripture. We're going to use a lot of scripture today. Um, I'm going to start with 2 Timothy the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Listen to what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy. Timothy, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they will keep to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will be turned to fables. In the chap second, 20th chapter of the book of Acts, the apostle Paul has called for the elders at Ephesus to come and see him. Now, I'm not going to read this part, but while I'm here, I just have to tell you that Paul, when the elders came, he talked to them. But at the end of talking to them, he said, I, I won't be back. You will never see me again. And the elders at Ephesus fell down next to him and hugged him and embraced him and wept because of Paul's words that they would never see him again. And in my mind, that's one of the most beautiful pictures in all of the Bible, where the elders, the men, the leaders of the church at Ephesus are hugging Paul and weeping because they know that they will not see his face again. But in Acts 20, I want to begin reading in verse 28, and Paul is telling these elders from Ephesus to be careful, and this is what he says. Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The elders are the spiritual overseers of the church. He says to them, be shepherds to the, of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know, Paul says, that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you 
and will not spare the flock, even from your own number, even among the elders, men will arise and they will distort the truth, dis distort the truth in order to turn away disciples after them. And then in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for what it teaches. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit might guide our understanding of your word today. And Father, that your spirit might guide me as I preach your word, that I might be consistent with what your word teaches. Guide our message today. Help us, Lord, to learn to not be happy with division because it's against what Jesus wants for his followers. In Christ's name, amen. The Bible quite clearly tells us that false preachers and false teachers, men in sheep's clothing, will appear and they will lead many people away from the church, away from the truth of the scriptures. With eloquent words, they will proclaim a gospel that sounds good, that sounds reasonable, but it is a lie. These men, and in some cases women, in our day and age, will teach false doctrine, false practices, and false religion. They will deceive the world, and they will even deceive the church, the elect of God, the children of God, will be deceived by these false teachers and these false preachers. I can't speak for you, but I know I've met people in my life, and you probably have two that were different on the outside than what they were on the inside. They were nice, pleasant people, easy to get along with, but given the chance, they would turn on you and take advantage of you and attempt to lead you astray. When I was growing up, my mom and dad had a motel on West Hillsboro Avenue in Tampa, way out three miles past Town Mary. It's called the Green Meadows Motel. It was a tourist court, the old kind where they had a cabin, individual cabins, and you would park next to it. It's long gone. Um, torn down, disappeared. But when we moved from Chicago, they bought that, and in the middle of it was a building that was supposed to be a restaurant. And my dad worked for Zenith Radio and TV in Chicago, so he opened up a TV repair shop, and he fixed TVs, and my mom ran the motel. I saw a lot of people over the course of years take advantage of my mom and dad. One time this couple came and they knocked on the door, they came in the motel office and they gave my mother a sob story about how they've been living in their car out on the Courtney Campbell Causeway. And um, the man had, he said, I just got a job and I get my first paycheck. And this was like on a Sunday afternoon. He said, I get my first paycheck next Friday and if you would please give us a room so we could not live in this car another day, um, we'll pay you what we owe you on Friday. My mother said, okay. My mother cooked two meals, two dinners, suppers, one for her family and she carried one out to that couple. She did that every day for a week. The man got in the car and left every day. His wife stayed there. We'd see him out and they walked the circle around the motel. And they, they always were very friendly, very outgoing, love to stop and talk to you. And uh, come Saturday morning, my mom decided to go out there. The car was there 
Friday afternoon, but they, uh, sometime they left Friday evening. And when mom went out there and knocked on the door, they were gone. And not only did they leave, but they took everything in that motel room they could take, sheets, pillows, towels, everything, and left. So my mother gave them a room for a week and fed them for a week, only to have them get in their car and drive away. I've met people like that. Maybe you have met people like that. The Bible says that those things will happen in the church, that those kinds of people, soft-spoken, mild-mannered, meek, seemingly humble, will come into the church. They're like sheep, but inwardly they are raving wolves, and their purpose is to turn the church around or to influence people to do that which is not right. First Peter, the second chapter, the first three verses, listen to what it says. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately will bring dam damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you. From 110 A.D. to over 400 A.D. It was known as the, in, in church history as the first great apostasy. Apostasy is a word that simply means that uh, people deserted the word of God, um, that they uh, departed from the word of God. And it was during this great apostasy that, that there was a departure from the teaching of the apostles uh, there was a desert, they deserted what the apostles taught, and many heresies, many things that were taught were, I mean, unscriptural things were taught and brought into the church, and many, many denominations still uh, follow some of those teachings that came during the great apostasy. Many of those false teachings and doctrines are followed today. I believe that there are many in the denominational world, the denominational world of Christianity, who have been led astray by men preaching false doctrines, false teachings. I am not one of those people who believes, like some do, that we're all on different roads, but we're all headed to the same place. I've heard that a lot of times. Well, yes, there's a lot of division in the church. There's a lot of different teachings, but we're all on a different road, but we're all headed the same place. We're all going to heaven. I don't believe that. This idea that we're all different on different roads, but headed for the same place is not a scriptural teaching. It's a man-made teaching. Listen to what Jesus says in the seventh chapter of Matthew verses 13 through 15. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many will go that way, because straight is the gate, and narrow the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are raving wolves. Jesus taught there are two roads, one right wide road which leads to hell and one narrow road which leads to heaven. I was teaching a class one day at First Christian Church in Bradenton and the man said, well, why did God create a wide road to hell and a narrow road to heaven? And I said, God didn't create those roads. Man created them. The road to hell is wide because many choose not to believe. Many choose not to follow Jesus Christ, and the road to hell is very wide because the world is full of disbelievers. 
and the road to heaven is narrow and few people have found it because the gospel many don't follow the true gospel of Christ but the road to heaven is narrow because only a few people are finding it there are just two roads all of this division that we have in Christianity is wrong it's wrong the Gospel of John let me turn to the Gospel of John and in the uh, 17th chapter of the Gospel of John I'm going to be begin reading in verse 20 17 Gospel of John beginning with verse 20 Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and this is part of his prayer I do not pray for these alone meaning the disciples he doesn't just pray for the disciples but he says also on those who will believe me through their preaching that they all might be one not w-o-n-o-n-e one that all of those who believe on me through the preaching of the disciples might be one, one, one group, one body. There is but one body of Jesus Christ. He said that they all may be one. He says, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world might believe you have sent me. When there is unity among the followers of Christ, the world will take notice. But because there is so much division in the world today among Christianity, that people laugh at us. You all preach different systems of church government, different ways to get to heaven. You have different doctrines and different practices and you do all so many things, you worship idols and and the, the list goes on and he the, the, the Jesus wanted us to be one united together his followers and he prayed for that in the garden of in Gethsemane he says that the glory which you gave me I have given them the disciples that they might be one just as we are one I and them you and me that they may be made perfect and one that the world might believe and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me you have loved me Jesus prayed that not only would his disciples be united together but he prayed that all of those people who would believe on their preaching would be united together one body not div not divisive not many divisions but one he called for unity he prayed for unity I can't speak, oh, going backwards. The apostle taught that division was wrong. Second Corinthians, the first chapter. Um, I'm going to say something here in a minute. You probably may or may not appreciate it, but I'm going to say it because it illustrates what Paul is saying here. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. He says, Paul says to the church at Corinth, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what he says, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, of the, by those of Chloe's household, that there are divisions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. They were calling themselves 
after the names of the men who converted them to the Lord. Well, I'm a Christian by Apollos. Well, I'm a Christian by Cephas. This is what Paul says. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. So why would you call yourselves after my name? Now, if he was writing this today, it would sound something like this. Did Martin Luther die for you? Were you baptized in the name of Martin Luther? Well, the answer would be no. Then why would you call yourselves Lutherans? That's an exact illustration of what he is saying in the Bible. Why call yourself after a man's name? It is Jesus Christ who died for you. It is in the name of Jesus Christ you were baptized. We are Christians. The Bible says that the followers of Christ were first called Christians in Antioch. Christians, that's what they went by in the early church. We are known as Christians. Somebody says to me, they'll say to me, what are you, George? And I say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian too. So they're going to figure out what I am. So they'll say, well, what church do you go to? And I say, well, where else would I go? I go to the Christian church. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I don't wear a man's name. I don't follow a denominational teaching. I follow Jesus Christ. I belong to him. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. The suffix I-A-N means belonging to. So when you call yourselves a Christian, you're saying that I'm a person who belongs to Jesus Christ. What other name do we need? Amen. You ask people what they are and you will get a list of names. They call themselves all kinds of things. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I have to illustrate what I'm saying. I'm a Methodist. Oh, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Lutheran. I'm Episcopalian. I don't understand. We're Christians. We belong to Jesus Christ. Why do we wear sectarian names? Names do nothing but divide the church. I'm this, you're that, he's something else. That division is not what Jesus Christ prayed for. It's not what he died for. He wants the followers of Christ to be united. Just because we live in an age where Christianity, Christianity is divided does not mean that we have to accept it. That we have to accept division. Christ is not the author of division. The Bible teaches that division is wrong. We, you, and I cannot accept division. We can't be comfortable with it. In John 4, 1 John 4, 1, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Within Christianity, there are false teachers and false preachers. I see them. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't sleep very well at night and I turn on the TV. And a lot of these, quote, Christian preachers, they, they buy television time at night because it's the only time they can afford it. And I listen to them and I talk to them. They can't hear me. But I tell them, you're not teaching the truth. You're telling a lie. That's not what the Bible teaches. But they preach it and they teach it like it's God's word. And this idea, well, God spoke to me. He, he spoke to me, told me. I've shared this with you before. There are 10 people out there in TV land that are going to send me $1,000. God told me that. 
God didn't tell him that. He made that up. God doesn't tell us anything that's not in addition. He doesn't tell us things that are in addition to the scripture. The scripture is all sufficient, the Bible says. We must examine the doctrine and the preaching and the teaching to make sure that what we believe and what we teach is consistent with the Bible. If we are led astray, we have no one to blame but ourselves. The question I want to raise, one of them is, what is the ultimate fate of those who have been led astray? Many people are sincere. I've been told that before by others. Well, they're very sincere. My dad always said, the road to hell is paved with sincerity. Sincerity is good, but sincerity won't save you. We, what we believe must agree with what the Bible teaches. If you are led astray by false teaching and false preaching, you have no one to blame but yourself. Even Jesus said that not all people who profess to be his followers will go to heaven. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew, the seventh chapter, first book in the New Testament, chapter seven of Matthew. I want you to hear what Jesus says. Chapter seven, I'm gonna begin reading in verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Many, many will say to me in that day, listen to this, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Not my name, Lord, in your name we've prophesied. And in your name we've cast out demons, and in your name we have done many wondrous things in your name. And Jesus said, and I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. There are many people in this world who are doing things in the name of Jesus Christ. And at judgment, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Just because someone uses the name Christ and what they teach or preach does not mean it's right. And Jesus quite clearly tells us that in Matthew 7. Now, I might run into a little difficulty with you at this point, but there is a prevalent teaching. Now, there are many false doctrines in the world today going around, many false teachings, and I'm going to share one false teaching with you, and you, you may not agree with me. You don't have to agree with me, but I hope you'll listen to what I have to say before you make your final decision. There are a lot of false teachings and doctrines in the world. A lot of them are man-made. And I want to teach one, I want to share one with you uh, today. There's a teaching that we've all heard. I hear it all the time. I have the radio in my car tuned to the Christian radio station, and I hear them preach their sermons. Some of them preach very good sermons, but at the end, they say something that is not scriptural. It's called a sinner's prayer. All you have to do is pray, and you will be saved. My friends, I want to tell you something. That is not scriptural. That is a man-made teaching. Now, if you have time this week, go on your computer and look up, just Google, the origin of the sinner's prayer. I did, and I'm just going to read a small excerpt to you of what I found. 
just to listen to this. Man-made religious doctrines increasingly rejected God's word, which requires men to be baptized to be saved. The Anabaptists rejected God's word concerning baptism, so they were forced to invent a human doctrine prescribing the point of one's salvation. Praying to be saved became their substitute for God's command to be baptized. In the end, baptism was regulated or relegated not to have anything to do with salvation, and in time, the phrase baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace was invented and adopted by as Protestant doctrine. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior says, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved. And they will say, that's what he said, but that's not what he meant. In Acts 2, 38, he told the Jews, he preached the first gospel sermon that included the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he said, you men with wicked hands have crucified the Messiah. And the Bible says they were pricked in their heart and said, what must we do? Well, it was evident they believed. So he went on and he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they will come along and say, well, that's what Peter said, but that's not what he meant. Turn with me. This is important. Turn with me to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts, the 16th chapter. In Acts, the 16th chapter, I'm sorry, in Acts, yeah, Acts 16. I'm going to begin reading, and I want you to read with me. I don't want you to get ahead of me. <clears throat> I'm going to begin reading in verse number 25, Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, and that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed, and the keeper of the prison awakening from his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open was open, suppose the prisoners had all fled, and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, we're all here. And he called for a light, and he ran in, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, Paul and Silas, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now stop right there, don't read anymore. You and your household, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith-only group, they draw a line right there and they say, there it is. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. No more than that and you'll be saved. They don't read to you the rest of this. And I'm going to read it to you. Beginning in verse 20, 32. Then listen what happened. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in the house. There was more to say than just believing. There was something else in addition to that. And it says they took him the same hour of the night and they washed their stripes and immediately they were all baptized. Now they don't read that part. They just read, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the Bible says, and they explained the word of God more fully and took them out the same hour of the night and baptized them. They don't want you to see that part. 
They caused division in the church. The apostle Paul, while Saul of Tarsus, if you remember the story, was on the Damascus Road and his eyes were blinded and he was told to go in and a man would come and tell him what to do. And in Acts 22, Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias comes to Saul of Tarsus and this is what he says. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Oh, that's what he said, but that's not what he meant. Now listen, the water in the baptistry has nothing to do with washing away your sins. It is the blood of Christ that washes away your sins. But when does God wash away your sins? When you come to him to be saved, you come with a believing heart and a believing mind. The Bible tells us to repent of our sins, to be sorry that you've walked your own way in life, that you've disobeyed God, and be sorry, repent that you have done that, confess that faith, and be baptized. And it's at that point, because you believed, because you repented, and confessed his name, that in baptism, God works. You don't work, you're submitting to baptism. God works on your behalf to cleanse you of your sins. As many of us have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death. It was at his death the blood was shed, and it is at baptism that that blood is applied and we rise to walk in a new life. Not one single solitary person in all of New the New Testament was saved by praying a prayer. Show me just one. One person where Peter said, Peter didn't say when they said, what must we do? We've crucified the Messiah. He didn't say, bow your heads and repeat after me. He said, repent and be baptized. When the, when the, when the uh, Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch and they were riding in a chariot and he was he was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and he says is Isaiah the man who was taken like a sheep to the slaughter or is it somebody else and Philip began that that scripture to preach unto him Jesus it does not say anywhere that he said that he needed to be baptized but he must have, because the Ethiopian said, look, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? And Philip says, if you believe, you may. And he says, I, and the King James, it says, he said, and I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. They stopped the chariot, and they both went down into the water. Baptism was a burial in water. Peter didn't have him, I mean, Philip didn't have him stand on his shore and scoop up some water and pour it on his head. The Bible said they went into the water. Man changed the form of baptism to sprinkling or pouring. In the New Testament, it was always an immersion. The Greek word baptism means an immersion, a plunging under. But man has come along and has changed the gospel, has changed the teaching of the Bible, and they stand in their pulpits and they preach it. If you like my sermon today, when I was growing up in Chicago, we went to a church that was called the, um, uh, I already forget the name, oh, Evangelical Free Church. Evangelical Free Church. Um, the preacher would say, now everybody close your eyes, we're all standing, everybody close your eyes, don't look. Now I'm gonna pray a prayer, and if you're not saved, you repeat that prayer. And he would say, raise your hand. And if you prayed that prayer, and he'd say, well, there's one, and there's one, and there's one. Well, I didn't know if there was one or not, I had my eyes closed. But people, don't, you have, you have to understand that the Bible, many people are changing the gospel. A couple more scriptures. 
In Matthew 24, 4, Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceives you. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verses 17 through 18, Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you have learned from us, and avoid them, for they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. Words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. My friends, many people have been misled, thinking all of the time that they are right. They're right with Christ because they have said a prayer. My challenge to you this morning is to make sure, absolutely sure, that what you believe is scripturally correct. Make sure that your faith is of God and not man. Study God's word. Be inquisitive. Question what you hear. Go home and search the scriptures to see if it is so what you were told. But just don't like so many in this world. Just sit back and say, well, that must be right because the preacher said it because it just might be wrong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what it teaches. Father, help us to know. Lord, help us to be good students of your word. Help us to study and rightly divide your word. Help us to rely on your Holy Spirit to guide us that we may know the truth and we might know the freedom that the truth brings. In Christ's name, amen. Now, just one more thing, and I won't bore you any longer. Um, salvation, it's a free gift of God. You don't have to do anything to be saved. It's a free gift of God. I've been told all you have to do is reach out your arm of faith and take the gift. You can't do anything to save yourself. You just reach out your arm of faith and take it. If I have to reach out my arm and take it, I'm doing something for my salvation. I'm reaching out. Well, why can't you just carry that through? The Bible says, repent of your sins. Why can't that be part of reaching out? Something that people don't understand, salvation, let me finish before you go, oh no. Salvation is conditional. The Bible says you cannot be saved unless you believe. Believing is a condition to being saved. It's a condition. That's why we send missionaries all over the world, because people haven't heard about Christ and they haven't believed. Repentance is a condition. Confessing Jesus before men is, is, a, is a condition. And baptism is. It's not a work. People have branded it a work. But it's not a work. It's an act of obedience. Just like believing is a command of Christ, and we have to believe to be saved, baptism is the same. So I just encourage you to understand the truth of the scriptures and be obedient to it.